Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship once again this morning on this second Sunday of Easter. We are still in Easter tide for the next several weeks, so we can keep practicing our alleluias. Um, welcome to everyone who is here in person. Welcome to those who are joining us online via our live stream. Welcome if this is your first time worshiping with us, and welcome if this is your 541st time worshiping with us. If you're from down the street or from around the world, <clears throat> if you have all the faith in the world or all the doubts and questions, you are in the right place. I am Reverend Tom Reed. I'm the pastor here at Newton Presbyterian Church, and I've had a little bit of a sinus infection this week, so hence the scratchiness. I'm not working on my like lounge singing career or anything. Um, <clears throat> and here in this church, we believe and we live out God's truth that God invites all people into worship and to participate fully in the life of this community, whatever your skin color, whatever your gender identity, whomever you love, wherever you fall on the age spectrum, you are beloved and you are welcomed by God here. Um, a special welcome to our guest organist this morning, um, David Jesse Clevenger. We're so happy to have you with us this morning. And um, David's DJ's bio is in the bulletin, so please take a look at that. Um, and we give thanks for the, the musical gifts that we will be experiencing in worship today. Um, for anyone who is new to Newton Presbyterian Church, we do have pew cards in the back of the pews that you can fill in. If you're joining us online and would like more information about our congregation, you can go to our website, and in the upper right-hand corner, there's a Contact Us link where you can fill in your information, and someone will be in touch, and we'll add you to our weekly mailing list with information about the life of our church. Also, if you are joining us on the live stream right now, um, please take a moment to greet one another in the chat. You can share where you're joining us from geographically. You can um, share prayer requests. You can respond at any point in worship, and it's a wonderful way to be connected even if we are physically separated. Um, it is the first Sunday of the month, so we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper today. So if you are at home as well, this is your reminder to go find a piece of bread or something bread-like and some juice or something juice-like, and you can join us at, um, when we share in the feast together. I also remind us that our, our Muslim siblings continue in the holy month of Ramadan. They will end their month of fasting and praying um, this coming Tuesday when they will observe Eid al-Fitr or the Feast of the Sacrifice to end uh, this sacred time for them. So one last time on a Sunday, let us wish a blessed Ramadan to all who are observing this sacred month. Be sure to check the bulletin for activities this week. Um, join us for fellowship time after worship. And as a reminder, we have, we're having a breakfast club before worship on Sundays where we're, we've been reading um, Easter poems, and then we're going to return back to My Neighbor's Faith next week. So please join us at around 9, and, um, and we'll have, we have breakfast and have wonderful, rich conversations. Um, a, a note that's in your bulletin, the two roses on our communion table this morning are celebrating the birth of... Evelyn Mary and Stephanie Arlene to our beloved mem community members Sherry and Jack Holder. We give thanks to God for a successful birth for a healthy mother and children and for the abundance that is spilling over in the Holder household. Thanks be to God for that wonderful gift. Are there any other announcements to lift up this week? All right. So before Allison leads us in our call to worship this morning, let us pause for a moment, as is our custom. Uh, in his resurrection appearances, we'll be reminded today that Jesus speaks words of peace to his disciples when he first appears, and then he breathes on them, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. I invite you to close your eyes if you're comfortable and take some deep breaths along with Jesus in this 
season of Easter, let us remember Jesus' spirit, this ruach in the Hebrew, this sacred breath, and Jesus' words of peace, which are also extended to us. As we breathe in together, let us breathe in Christ's peace. And as we exhale, let us breathe out Christ's abundant love for all creation. One more time, breathe in peace and breathe out love. You may open your eyes if you close them. And one more time, let us say, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Come, let us worship our risen Savior. Good morning, church. Good morning. My name is Allison Penn. I'm one of the deacons, and I am glad to be leading you in worship today as the liturgist. Please join me in our call to worship as printed in your bulletin. Into our fears and through our locked doors, come, almighty God. When we think peace be with you means no change or disruption, Come, Lord Jesus. Amidst our lives that confuse religious entertainment with Easter fulfillment, come, Holy Spirit, for the sake of a community meant to be its best during crisis. Come, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please... You may be seated. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin together. O oh Lord, our God, we think our best should happen when we are in control. Forgive us for not expecting the risen Christ to show up when we are anxious, content to lock the doors of your house for fear of all that is outside. 
Forgive us for thinking that church mainly happens inside these walls and not into the world you so love and into which we are sent. Forgive us for looking in for your power in all the conventional places, but never in places of brokenness, crisis, and defeat. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, repair what we are, and by the power of Christ's resurrection, raise us up to serve others for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Beloved, you are already forgiven, loved, and whole. In Christ, you are fully flourishing human beings. Go and live like it. In the Spirit, you are not an isolated spiritual being doing Christianity alone, but you are part of a community of faith. So go build that by the grace of God, every human being is seen, loved, and made whole. Go practice that. Together in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us share Christ's peace with each other. Before we continue with our moment for mission, um, I ask everyone to turn and face the camera in the center of the back wall and give a peace wave to those who are joining us virtually, either with us right now live or in the future. Peace be with you as well. I would like to share with you that each month when we come to a communion on the first Sunday, we always are thinking about our neighbors who don't have enough at their table. So in the months of March and April, we are collecting boxes of mac and cheese 
for the Center Street Food Pantry. Please feel free to bring those at any time. We're putting them in the fireplace room, which is through this closed door right here. And we are happy to take those at any time um, during this month of April. Can I invite our young people up front? Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning, everybody. Oh, that was wrong. Do you want to come sit up here, Alex? You going to say hi to DJ? <laughs> oh, he's up here again. All right. So who, who can tell me what doubt is? Yes? Maybe, um, but in this case, I'm thinking a doubt is when you aren't sure about something. It's, it's, this is more of a, a feeling or a thought. But so, in, and in our story, Bible story today, we're going to read about um, the disciples after Jesus has risen from the dead. What does what mean? Disciples? Dis oh, good question. Disciples are the followers of Jesus, the, the original 12 who lived at the same time as Jesus. And what's that? The, the, there's 12 people, the 12 disciples. Also good questions. Wow. <laughs> Going straight to it this morning. Um, and so after Jesus was risen and his body had disappeared, the disciples were afraid. Well, that's a good, also a good question. He was, we know that he was resurrected, that he, he lived again after he died. But the, the disciples didn't know that at the time. So they were having all kinds of doubts about what had happened, what they were going to do. And in the, in the scripture we're going to read today, the disciples are actually hiding in a room in a, with a locked door because they're afraid of what's going on and what could happen to them. And in the midst of this, Jesus comes to them. And as I said in our opening, he says, peace be with you to them, even when they're scared and locked away in this room. And then he, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And what's that? Jesus isn't scared, but the disciples are, because they don't know all that's going to happen. We know the whole story, which is a very helpful knowledge point. Um, but one person's missing when Jesus appears to all of them. Thomas, the disciple, we, the scripture will tell us, wasn't there in the room. And so he missed seeing Jesus alive again and being able to see and feel him in person. Um, and he hears about it from everybody. And he says, I won't believe unless I can see and feel Jesus for myself. And a week later, you know what happens? There, everybody's gathered together in that same room, and Thomas is with them this time, and Jesus appears to them. And he goes to Thomas and says, I'm here. Feel, see me and feel my hands and believe. And Jesus, or Thomas says, re recognizes it's Jesus and believes and says, my Lord and my God. So what, what do you think this might be telling us? Any ideas? Alex, you have any ideas? Well, why do you think there's somebody who's doubting in the Bible story? It's a hard question, but I'm, I'm taking the risk here. Um, because I think it's because it, God wants us to know that it is okay to have doubts and it's okay to have questions. That's part of what it means to be a faithful Christian and a faithful believer. And so we have Thomas in the story who doubts or questions or is afraid, but Jesus meets him and says, I see you, and Thomas is able to believe and continue on his journey. Does that make sense? All right, will you pray with me? Dear God, 
Thank you for loving us. When we are confident. And when we have doubts. And when we have doubts. Help us trust you with our questions. Help us trust you with our questions. And grow in our faith. And grow in our faith. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all for coming up. As we continue our worship of the risen Lord and prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed, please join me in a spirit of prayer. God of all who doubt and believe, by the gift of your spirit, open us to the wisdom of your word today and enlighten us with your truth. Enable us to recognize the risen Christ who comes and meets us even in the most isolated room we can find. May we be open to you and transformed by your holy word for us today. Amen. We have um, some short readings to start us off. The first one is from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. You want a quick hint? It's on page 884 in your pew Bible. I always like following along, and sometimes it takes a while to get there. So page 884. Again, this is from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Now, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Our next reading is from the Psalms. It is a responsive psalm and quite brief. This is Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3. You just read verse 2. <laughs> how good and how pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head, flowing down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, flowing down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon, flowing down upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. The second reading comes from 1 John, which is not the same as the Gospel of John. It's very, very close to the very back of your Bible. 1 John begins on page 994, if you are looking at the Pew Bible. <clears throat> we will be reading 1 John chapter 1, the very first verse, all the way to chapter 2, the second verse. We declare to you what was from the beginning that we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in God there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with God while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light, as God, God's self is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, 
and the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar, and God's word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with God, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The gospel reading comes from John. <laughs> I know this is confusing if you are not a Bible scholar. From the gospel of John, which is chapters, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. This begins on page 879 in your pew Bible. <clears throat> when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Happy Easter again, beloved. Don't get tired of saying that. We continue in the 50 days of Easter. Also, don't get tired of reminding everyone of that. It's not just one day, it's the whole season. And our gospel reading today picks up, conveniently, in the evening of the day of resurrection. So this is the same day as we were reading as last week. Hard to believe that, but it is. The opening of the Easter narrative in chapter 20 at the beginning reads, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, 
And that, that is when Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb alone at this early hour. And John's gospel account is a little different than the Markan one we read last week, so I'm going to do some um, summarizing. But Mary Magdalene comes alone, not with the three women, like, not in the group of three like we read last week. And Mary Magdalene sees that the stone has been removed from the tomb, and she immediately turns and runs to tell Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved to tell them this disturbing news. She says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And just recognizing that she says we there, that's interesting. Um, Simon Peter and the beloved disciple then go to the tomb, racing one another. I'm not sure at what speed Mary Magdalene is going with them, but they're racing, and they observe the empty tomb, and they notice the linen wrappings that had covered Jesus' body lying neatly rolled up. And then the two, the two, um, Simon Peter and the beloved disciple, return home. And Mary remains outside the tomb, and we're told that she is weeping. She, um, she looks into the tomb, brief, or she bends over and looks in the tomb, it says, and she sees two angels sitting in the tomb who ask her why she is weeping. And then Mary turns and sees a man who she does not recognize, and she assumes him to be the gardener, gardener excuse me. Um, and she pleads with him to tell her where he has taken Jesus' body if he was the one to have carried him away for whatever reason. And only when the man responds to her saying her name are her eyes opened and is she able to recognize her beloved teacher, Jesus, standing before her. She shouts, Rabuni, meaning teacher in Aramaic. The writer helpfully footnotes this, indicating that his, audi his intended audience is probably not a Hebrew speaker, but also he's erroneously saying that it's Hebrew when it's Aramaic. Uh, let's, we can go back to our conversation about inerrancy in Scripture this morning. Uh, <clears throat> which, um, which brings us to today's reading that starts at verse 19, which, and it reads, When it was evening on that day, meaning the same day, the first day of the week. So we are in the same day that we were before. As I said last Sunday, the Easter story at the heart of our faith is a complicated and messy story. We know, as we talked about with our young folks this morning, how we know how the story ends, but they did not. And it's always important to remember the fullness of this incredibly human experience shared by our forebears in the faith, who had to feel their way through all of this without knowing or understanding the whole story until later, no matter how many times Jesus may have tried to tell them what was going to happen. Many, if not all, of the disciples had placed their hopes and dreams in Jesus for one thing, liberation from Rome, from imperial occupation, imperial oppression. They saw in Jesus a new leader, a new kind of leader who would govern with justice and with righteousness, to borrow language from the prophet Isaiah. Then after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, at the peak of their hopes, they watched their beloved friend and teacher be betrayed by one of them, willing, and he then will, willingly accepted being handed over to the authorities who hated him, hated his work, and sought to eliminate this Galilean problem, this troublemaker in their midst whose reckless actions were attracting the attention of the Romans, Jesus and his ragtag group of followers risked incurring Rome's wrath and threatened the precarious balance the Judean leadership had fought to preserve. In order to ensure the con continuation of temple worship and Jewish religious practice, at least in some form as it was able to exist at that time, as well as ensuring their own survival in the continuation of their power, privilege, and influence. <coughs> and then these followers of Jesus watched as their beloved teacher was brutally murdered and with him their hopes of a brighter future. Then to top things off they are now hearing from some of their companions that Jesus' body has disappeared 
He is not where he was buried just two days before. And there are so many reasons why his body could be gone, why the authorities or others would want it to be gone, why those in power would want to teach all who followed this radical child of Israel a lesson. Do not mess with the leadership in Jerusalem. Do not mess with Rome. It will only result in pain and terror. And, and now we find the disciples. Many scholars believe that this is to mean more than the 12 minus Judas, but and, and in fact likely refers to a growing early ecclesia or assembly, what we will come to know as the church. We find the disciples gathered in a house with the doors locked out of fear of the eudaioi, it says in Greek, which the NRSV translates as the Jews and as it has often been translated in our 2,000 years of history, Christian history, rather than meaning the Jews, this should be understood to mean the Judean leadership, those who were in power in Judea, which is the remnant of the southern kingdom with its capital in Jerusalem. This, the, the Eudaioi, the Ju Judean leadership, were working to make an example of Jesus and protect the peace and the status quo in the land. I note the intense fear here not to blame the disciples or declare them weak of faith. On the contrary, I say this to humanize, to rehumanize this experience once again, to remind ourselves how scary and uncertain this whole experience would have been for them. Is there any hope now that Jesus is gone? Will they meet the same fate? What should their next steps be? Were they foolish to follow this Galilean troublemaker in the first place? There are so many doubts all around in this moment. And it is here in the midst of that fear and doubt and uncertainty that the risen Jesus returns to his disciples. As I mentioned at the beginning of worship, Jesus mysteriously enters the locked room. Perhaps he is able to walk through walls at this point. We don't know. Or perhaps the writer is wanting to reinforce for us the idea that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus. This risen Jesus then says to them, peace be with you. The traditional greeting, the traditional Hebrew greeting of Shalom Aleichem, which is the same root used today in Arabic. Assalamu Alaikum. Peace be upon you. According to the writer of John, this, this is the Pentecost moment on the eve of the, 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 the evening of the resurrection. This is the Pentecost moment we will celebrate in a few weeks when Jesus imparts the Holy Spirit unto all those gathered there in fear in that room. Receive the Holy Spirit, Jesus says. But there's more. The Spirit is not just something to have and to hold on to. It is not a possession. It is something that calls us to go and to do. Jesus points toward this when he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. There's a responsibility that comes with faith and following and receiving this Holy Spirit. And now let's turn our attention to the, another central character in today's gospel reading, Thomas, the disciple, not me. Thomas has gotten a bad rap during the last two millennia. He is often referred to as Doubting Thomas and has come to be defined primarily by this one brief moment of his journey as a Christ follower. Bless you. As I often do in my sermons, I want to ask ourselves, I want to ask us, is that really warranted? Thomas is not the only disciple who is confused and bewildered by what is going on in the chaos surrounding Jesus' arrest and execution. Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter, despite his protestations and grand claims of fidelity, denies knowing or having anything to do with Jesus, not once, but three times. Yet Peter is remembered as the rock of the church. 
And Thomas, on the other hand, is forever the doubter. Tradition says that he went on to evangelize in India, and there are Thomas, Thomasine, I guess, um, churches still worshiping in India today that trace their roots to Thomas's evangel evangelizing work so many centuries ago. Let us note that one of the other mentions of Thomas in John's gospel account is found in chapter 11, verse 16. After learning of Lazarus's, Laz, that's right, Lazarus's death, Jesus says that they are all to go back to Judea. The disciples, of course, take quick issue with the idea, um, reminding Jesus that the Udaioi, again, the Judean leadership, were just now trying to stone him after his last time in Judea. Jesus, I can hear them ask, do you really think it's a good idea to go back there? Really? Jesus cryptically answers, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. And Jesus continues saying, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples still do not understand and say, if he's asleep, no problem. And Jesus has to spell out for them that Lazarus has not merely fallen asleep, but rather has died. And Jesus needs to go to him. Lazarus is dead, Jesus says. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Enter Thomas, who again, the writers of John provide the footnote that he was called Didymus, meaning twin. And the Jewish annotated New Testament um, provides a helpful footnote that the name Thomas may actually be a transliteration of the Hebrew word for twin, to Oma. I did not know that. And so I share with you. So, enter Thomas, who says to his fellow disciples, let us also go to Judea, that we may die with him. That doesn't sit super well with the other disciples, I don't think. Um, and, and they are expressing their concern for Jesus' life and well-being, advising him not to go, but Jesus has made his intentions and his destiny clear to them. And apparently only Thomas, this doubter, is able to truly hear what Jesus is saying. Thomas alone demonstrates loyalty and faithfulness by urging the group to respect Jesus' decision and to go and stand by their teacher even if it means risking death. That, that doesn't sound so doubting to me. It also captures my attention that Thomas, according to the text, was the only disciple not present that first evening after the resurrection. All the disciples were gathered together in fear, we are told, except for Thomas. Where was he? Why was he not there? Was he all by himself? What was he thinking and feeling? Was he hiding by himself in fear? Was he searching for the others, not knowing where they were? He didn't have the luxury of cell phones or WhatsApp groups. Was he out searching for Jesus' body? We don't know. All we know was that he wasn't there for this momentous occasion. And understandably, after enduring so much trauma and stress, after living in the midst of incredible fear and uncertainty, I think, I hope we could all understand Thomas when he says, I can't risk believing in this absolutely crazy idea that Jesus has risen from the dead. I can't risk after all that I've been through unless I can see and feel it for myself unless I can truly know it. I can only then can I risk opening myself up to that kind of hope that my dear friend and teacher, my hope for the future of my people whom I know was murdered by the imperial authorities is not dead but lives. And what happens? Jesus appears again one week later on the dot. 
This time, Thomas is present. And what does Jesus say to Thomas? Does Jesus shame him for his declaration of his needs? Does Jesus chastise Thomas, saying, you should do or know better, young man? No. Jesus simply appears to all of them. And he says, peace be with you once again. Then already knowing what Thomas needs, Jesus meets Thomas right where he is. He says to Thomas, put your finger here. Reach out your hand. I am here for you. I understand what you need. I see you. And I will journey with you. The New Revised Standard Version translates Jesus' next words as do not doubt but believe. One commentator I read noted that doubt isn't really the best translation of the wording here. The Greek is apistos ala pistos. <coughs> Be not lacking belief, but believe. It's perhaps a more accurate translation. Do not separate yourself, Thomas, but be connected, be in relationship, be a part of this new and emerging community or movement. And Jesus' next words seem almost like an aside to us, the readers today. A little wink and a nod saying, I see you too. Like Thomas I am meeting you too, right where you are, Jesus says. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. You too, Jesus says to us, are part of this expanding story. Throughout John's gospel account, faith and believing are not merely about accepting facts. It is not, sorry Presbyterians, only an intellectual exercise. The writer of John uses relationship language to describe faith. Believing in Jesus is about entering into a deep, abiding relationship of recognizing the invitation and accepting it and taking the leap. The text here never says that Thomas actually touched Jesus. By the way, Jesus makes the offer to Thomas, and that seems to be the key. The risen Jesus opened himself and his life to Thomas in a way that Thomas could receive. Thomas, who was like the lost sheep, had somehow been separated from the rest of the group. Thomas had missed out. But Jesus can recognize this and see what's needed. And by meeting Thomas and what he was going through, Thomas is able to move from separation to the core Christian confession regarding Jesus, my Lord and my God. Thomas' encounter with the risen Jesus here is life-changing. Thomas is able to experience a resurrection of his own, of faith, hope, and possibility. As Christian Century contributor Reverend Josh Scott put it, <clears throat> Thomas discovered that Easter means our worst moments and our worst days do not define us. We can learn, our trust can grow, and we can be transformed. Our stories are not determined by our failures. Thanks be to God. Guilt, shame, and regret do not get the final word over us. End quote. Moreover, the story of Christ Christianity and what it means to be faithful followers of Jesus is about expansive relationship. Being an Easter people requires us not to hide or play it safe, shutting ourselves off from the world. The good news of the resurrection begins with one person alone, one woman alone in a quiet cemetery. 
It quickly expands to three followers, then to the beginnings of the gathered church that has temporarily locked itself away in fear, uncertain of its next steps, unable to trust in the gifts present among them, and in the call of God to love and serve and proclaim. Doubt is part of the story, beloved, but it does not and cannot end there. Jesus promises to be with us and for us in a deep, abiding relationship if we choose to be a part of it. As with Thomas and the disciples, the risen Jesus comes to us again and again. Resurrection is not a one-time thing. To quote Reverend Scott one last time, Jesus invites each one of us to experience resurrection right here and right now. Do not doubt, but believe, beloved. Amen. As we continue our worship in response to God's word read and proclaimed, let us join in singing our sermonic hymn number 399, We Walk by Faith and not by sight. Please rise on your feet or in your hearts as you are able. Each week after we hear the good news, we have an opportunity to say what we believe together. Often these words come from our church's creeds and confessions, and in these writings we remember, we tell the world and each other who we are, what we believe, and how we are to live according to God's word. Today's affirmation of faith comes from the study catechism adopted by the General Assembly in 1998. Um, please join uh, as printed in your bulletin. What do you affirm when you say that he was crucified, dead, and buried? That when our Lord passed through the door of real human death, he showed us that there is no sorrow that he has not known, no grief he has not borne, and no price he was unwilling to pay in order to reconcile us to God. What do you affirm when you say that on the third day he rose again from the dead, that our Lord could not be held by the power of death. Having died on the cross, he appeared to his followers, triumphant from the grave, in a new, exalted kind of life. In showing them his hands and his feet, the one who was crucified revealed himself to them as the Lord and Savior of the world. 
Please be seated. We become who we are called to be, not through getting, acquiring, and possessing, beloved, but in our giving. Each week, we also have a chance to reflect on God's movement in our lives and the many gifts we receive throughout our weeks and months on this earth. And we have a chance to reflect and think about how we are to respond to all that God is doing for us. To that end, let us worship God by giving our good gifts. You can give using the offering plates, the QR code in your bulletin, Venmo, or on our website. However you give, let us offer our lives to the Lord today.
Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, help us to say thank you, to live with gratitude, to look for the best in each other, and to live charitably with all. May your resurrection never stop surprising us, disrupting us, and transforming us until Christ's kingdom comes. Amen. Please be seated. As we continue our time in worship, let us now worship through prayer, bringing our celebrations, concerns, um, and other announcements to the community to God. Um, this morning, I ask that I'll get us started. I ask that you be praying for Mamie, who's not with us today. Um, they had a dear friend pass away. Um, back home, and we spent the weekend in Pennsylvania at the funeral, so I'm a little groggy, they're a little groggy, um, but God willing, they'll be back next week. So, God, in your grace, receive our prayer. Um, also, I know that we have two birthdays for sure, as represented by our roses on the, yeah, Tom, <laughs> Tom was shocked. <laughs> no, these two roses for <laughs> for our dear Evelyn and Stephanie, who we hope to meet in person soon, but are represented in these beautiful roses here on the communion table. So prayers of thanks, gratitude, and celebration that the delivery went smoothly and everyone is in good health and back at home. God, in, our gr God, in your grace, receive our prayers. Other prayer requests from the community? God, in your grace, receive our prayer. Sure. <laughs> you can think about it. Anything else from the congregation today? Shooting you with the body mic. Um, I got to spend last night, Dave and I went and spent last night with the uh, folks at the Scots Charitable Trust, which is the oldest uh, charitable organization in the West, founded in 1657 for indentured servants coming over from Scotland and working in an iron forge in Saugus for seven years. And I got to connect to um, Ken and Louise's grandsons, Alex and Greg, are involved in that. I saw, I met Ken McLeod who grew up in this church as well, um, and was reconnecting with some of our church's history and the Scottish community or Scots descended community in, in our region. So I give thanks for the saints who have come before us in this community. I give thanks for our roots, and again, ask for God's presence and support as we continue to build the church in our time. Mm for our blessed history and the future that we build together. God, in your grace, receive our prayer. I'd like to lift up my coworker, Sarah. She has um, become one of my really good friends at work, and she's just going through a really tough time with um, some, some health things, but also... Uh, a father who is going through cancer treatments that is making things complicated in her family, and they're all the way in California. So um, I just lift up Sarah and her 
wonderful spirit to keep caring for other people <laughs> while she is going through rough stuff. Prayers for Sarah. God, in your grace, receive our prayer. Jonah, are there any online? For health in Susan's family, God, in your grace, receive our prayer. One last prayer. It feels like it's been a month since last Sunday, but I had lifted up um, Reverend Rob Mark, who grew up in our congregation. I lifted up his friend, Tim, who was facing a, a very urgent, imminent terminal cancer diagnosis. And um, I found out early this week that Tim passed away on Easter morning. And thank, thankfully, Rob made the decision to fly to Montana on, on Friday and miss the end of Holy Week, but he was there. And I presided at the funeral on Friday. So I lift up our dear friend, Rob Mark. I lift up their family and all, and Tim in his memory, and all who knew and loved Tim. May God comfort them. May God's light perpetually shine. And may his memory long remain a blessing to all who know him. God, in your grace, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Well, not seeing any more hands, but knowing there are always more prayers in our hearts, let us now come to God in prayer. My Lord and my God, our Lord and our God, whether today is a day that we feel doubtful or faithful, we bring you our prayers regardless. God, we may not see when each prayer is answered, and we may be doubtful when we see cancer take lives too early or lives continually, continuously lost in the Holy Land. We wonder, where are our prayers going? But God, we know that even your disciples doubted and you love them still. And that even the doubters can be the greatest advocates for you in this world. And we believe that in bringing our prayers to you and believing that you work through us even when we don't see you, we advocate for you. God, we lift up all the prayers that have been brought up in our congregation today for our community, for the lives lost, and the lives gained. We know that you are present in all of it. Keep us prayerful and mindful as we move through our week, God, and let us attune our ears to the areas of our world that need our prayers. We lift up all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from north and south, from east and west, to sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to them, and then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Friends, this is the Lord's table, and I remind us that all that I remind us all that the Presbyterian Church USA has an open table and understands that all who trust and desire in Jesus Christ desire to encounter Christ here in this sacrament, this sacred meal, are welcome to participate. For all who are here in the sanctuary, when the time comes, you may come down the center aisle to receive the elements. The bread is gluten-free and the juice is unfermented grape juice. We hope that there's nothing to prevent you from joining in the feast today. So come, share the feast that Christ has prepared. Hear this invitation to you. Know, that, know and trust that you are welcome at Jesus' table. And come not because you must come, but because you may come.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. In every time and in every age, O oh God, it is good and faithful that we give you thanks for your mercy is sure and your steadfast love endures forever. In your compassion, you gave us Christ Jesus who sets us free from death and leads us to life eternal. And so with all creation, with all the needy and hungry ones, with all those who have enough and plenty, with creatures large and small, with sun and moon and stars, and with the saints of every age, we praise your name and join their unending hymn saying together, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, O God, creator of all things. By your power and love, you continue to deliver your people from bondage, thwart the designs of evil, show the way through the wilderness, turn hardship into righteousness, and reveal your hand upholding the just. Blessed are you, O Christ, servant of the universe. You came among us to feed and heal and teach, to confound the haughty, to confuse the deceivers, to challenge the wrong-hearted, and in all these things to give hope to those who long for peace. On the night before he met with death, Jesus came to the table with those he loved. He took bread and praised you, God of all creation. He broke the bread among his disciples and said, take this, all of you. This is my body given for you. When supper was ended, Jesus took a cup of the common fruit of the vine and he gave thanks to you God of all creation. He passed the cup among his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and drink of it. This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering our Lord's self-giving love, we proclaim the mystery of faith together. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Blessed are you, O Spirit, giver of life. You give us words when we have none. You fill us with vision when we have the most need. You give us voice to proclaim our faith in every hour. Be our guide and teacher today and always. Come now, O Prince of Peace, Spirit of love, breath of life. Bring to all this hurting world the joy that Mary knew and teach us to proclaim with her, I have seen the Lord. In the unity of the Holy Trinity, in gratitude for this great day, season of resurrection, we praise you, God, of all that is, now and forever. And let all God's people say together, Amen. And as Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Come to me and never be hungry. Believe in me and never thirst. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Come, beloved, all is prepared.
Please pray with me. Here at this table, we celebrate resurrection as you feed us with bread and wine. And as much as we might prefer to stay here in this protected place, you send us back to our work. Only it is no longer the same work because we know you are with us and in us, shaping and transforming us to be your witnesses in the world, nourished in body, mind, and spirit. May all that we say and do give you glory. Amen. Let us continue worshiping God with our closing hymn, number 122, Thine is the glory. Please rise on your feet or in your hearts as you are able. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. The work of the church is not over, beloved. It has just begun. So go with joy where the crucified and risen Christ is sending you. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forevermore. And let all God's people say together, Amen.